Our gospel lesson is from the 12th chapter of the gospel according to St. Luke, verses 49 through 56. Would you please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel? Jesus is speaking and says, I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on there will be five in one family, divided against each other, three against two, two against three. They will be divided father against son, son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. and Daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And then he said to the crowd, When you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say it's going to rain. And it does. And when the south wind blows, you say it's going to be hot. And it is. Hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. These are amazing times in which we live. And they are exciting times, but they're also troubling times. People who lived before us could never have imagined traveling on a jet aircraft or using personal computers or even cell phones or living a COVID-19 pandemic with total isolation. Yet this is a world where the movement of the stars can be predicted because of Earth's orbit around the sun. You see, stars appear to move because during the year, they don't return to the same spot in the sky at the same time every night they appear to move. Because as the Earth orbits around the sun, it winds up on the other side of the sun every six months. Yet, here we are. Men walking on the moon, knowing how to go, get to the stars, but still many don't know how to get to heaven. And every day our world is changing, getting closer to socialism, moving us away from God and Christian principles. So our lesson today is a call for people of faith, you, to understand the times in which you are living. Over these past weeks, we've been studying Luke chapter 12. And last Sunday, we examined how to be a good servant and what that had to do with the second coming of Jesus. And we learned three things. Jesus commanded us, be dressed, be ready, and keep your lamps lit. Now today, Jesus is warning his disciples and anyone who would listen, when you read the signs of the times, you'll know what to expect. Last week, it was be ready. Today, it's interpret the times. And in reading the times for God's judgment, there are four things you should know. And the first is, His judgment is real. A.D. 79, in the Roman city of Pompeii, they suffered the destructive eruption of Mount Vesuvius just six miles east of Naples, Italy. I've been there. I've walked the rim of Mount Vesuvius and I walked down to the mouth of that volcano a little way. It smelled sulfury, 
kind of like rotten eggs. And I've walked the streets of Pompeii. And you've seen those tragic pictures that show the explosion of Mount Vesuvius. It was so sudden. The residents were killed immediately going about their daily routines. And they were entombed forever, buried alive in that volcanic ash from the lava that poured from that mountain that day. But what you may not realize is the citizens of Pompeii did not have to die. It's recorded that for weeks prior to the eruption, there were sounds of rumbling in that mountain. The earth was shaking. Ominous plumes of smoke were coming out of the volcano and were visible for days before the eruption. And the citizens of Pompeii died because they ignored the warnings. They didn't believe it was going to happen. Which shows us warnings are good only if you respond to them. It's the same with sirens blowing a warning of an approaching tornado. Or the public announcements on the TV or radio warning of a hurricane coming. And that brings us to the second point of our lesson. You need to prepare for God's judgment because His judgment is coming. Charles Colson writes about this in his book, Who Speaks for God? You remember Chuck Colson was the attorney serving as the special counsel for President Richard Nixon from 1969 to 1970. He was the political advisor to the president. He was also known as President Nixon's hatchet man. And at the height of the Watergate scandal, Colson gained notoriety as one of the Watergate Seven. Five men were caught burglarizing the Democrat National Committee's headquarters in the Watergate complex in Washington, D.C., June 7, 1972, along with Howard Hunt, G. Gordon Liddy, you remember them. Colson pleaded guilty to obstruction of justice for attempting to frame Pentagon Papers defendant Daniel Ellsberg. Remember that? Colson went to prison for that in 1974. In 1975, he was released after serving seven months in minimum security at the federal prison in Montgomery, Alabama, right outside Maxwell Air Force Base. He was the first member of the Nixon administration to be imprisoned for Watergate-related charges. Later, he bought a home here in Naples, up in Port Royal. And then October 2000, Florida Governor Jeb Bush restored Colson's civil rights, allowing him to vote, sit on a jury, run for office, practice law. But back in 1973, prior to his imprisonment, Chuck Colson had become an evangelical Christian. And his conversion sparked a radical change in his life. It led to his founding the nonprofit ministry Prison Fellowship. He wrote a book, and in his book, he writes of the night he came to understand he was a sinner and on his way to judgment. Chuck Colson wrote, That night, when I sat alone in my car, my own sin, not just dirty politics, but the hatred and evil so deep within me was thrust before my eyes forcefully and painfully. And for the first time in my life, I felt unclean. And worst of all, I could not escape. And in those moments of clarity, I found myself driven irresistibly into the arms of the living God. 
end quote. And just like that, Charles Coulson and many others came to realize that they were on their way to stand before the heavenly judge guilty as they were headed for judgment. And you know, the wisest thing to do when you're guilty is to settle out of court before your judgment is handed down. And that makes sense because God as judge of all the earth will one day judge Everybody on this earth. And the only verdict that can be expected is guilty. And when you're guilty, you have to pay the ultimate price. Romans 3, 11 through 20 says, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands there is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good. Not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison vipers on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. And their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law of Moses. Rather, through the law of Moses, we become conscious of our sin. And it is only by having Jesus Christ as your advocate, your heavenly defense attorney, to speak on your behalf at the judgment bar of God that you will ever be set free. Your trust and belief in him. And his defense of you will probably go like this. Well, since someone must pay for your sin, I will. And I've already done it for you. I took your place on the cross for your sins. And now they are forgiven. And if he can't say that for you, you're going to pay a heavy price for your sin. And your sentence will be eternal separation from the presence of God. And that's called hell. So you better settle with God before it's too late. And you know, people will do almost anything to stay out of jail. But how many people are going to have enough self-control to stay out of hell? Well, the answer to that question is, how well are you preparing yourself for your future judgment? It has to do with how you interpret this present time. Preparation begins now with a sense of your own sin. Remember just a minute ago when I was telling you about Charles Colson when he sat in his car alone and said, my own sin, not just dirty politics, but the hatred and evil so deep within me was thrust before my eyes forcefully and painfully. And for the first time in my life, I felt unclean. And that brings us to the third point of our lesson. Preparing for God's judgment requires real change. That's the point Charles Colson was making. He had to change his life. And it's tough to change your life. Really tough. In fact, 
Changing your life may be the most challenging and uncomfortable thing you'll ever do. One person I know said, if I want to change my life, I have to change my life. And that can be very scary. It all depends on why you want to change your life. Well, and you may need to move to another city where you don't know anyone in order to let go of your past. You may need to make new friends. There may be some reasons why some people move to Everglades City, Chokoloski, Plantation, Copeland, or even to your city where you are. They want to get away. They want to start all over again. In other words, changing life means making tough decisions. So how badly do you want to change your life? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to give up in order to make that happen? Well, you must realize that once you decide to change your life, Anything is possible. And that leads to the fourth and final point of our lesson today. Preparation involves accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Giving your life completely and totally over to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's how you change your life. Billy Graham said it like this. The most important decision you will ever make is to turn your life over to Jesus Christ. And it will be the wisest decision you'll ever make. Why? For one thing, God wants to give you the strength to deal with your circumstances and not be overcome by them. He wants to give you the wisdom to deal with your problems instead of making them worse for yourself by making more bad decisions. And most of all, he wants to forgive your past. He wants to give you hope for the future. Forgiveness of your past, hope for your future, that's what this is all about. And the promise is, in 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. All this is from God. So my friend, if you're interpreting the times in which you're now living, you must discover for yourself how Jesus can come into your life today. Having Jesus as your Lord and Savior is the only way to face God's judgment and to be found not guilty. Amen. We're going to sing 589.